Warm greetings and welcome to this Seaweed World Water Week seminar, one of nine featured seminars of World Water Week supported and shaped by the Scientific Program Committee. My name is Fred Boltz. I'm honored to serve on the Scientific Program Committee for this World Water Week and to co-convene this private sector focused seminar with terrific partners in Waterlinks, IKEA, the University of Sheffield, the CEO Water Mandate, and the World Business Council for Sustainable Development, and my firm, Resolute Development Solutions. On behalf of all of us, welcome, and thank you for joining us in this seminar. Private sector leadership is vital to an effective global response to climate change in water and across systems and sectors. Throughout human history, our ingenuity and enterprise has enabled humanity to adapt and to, and, and to surmount seemingly impossible challenges. And now again, we must call upon our ability to innovate and to adapt to new normals and even greater challenges. And the private sector must join in leading that great transformation. Our seminar will focus on this critical dimension of private sector leadership on water and climate resilience in uncertain times. Over the course of this World Water Week, we will hold four sessions uh, for the seminar. And those include the first featuring corporate leadership today, a second focusing on collective action to deliver impact and improve water resilience for businesses and communities on Tuesday, as you can note on the screen. And then our third and fourth sessions will actually be the same uh, approaches and standards of practice for water system management and adaptation under climate and societal change. And those will take place on Wednesday uh, and a repeated session on Thursday so that we can ensure full participation across time zones. Session one today is pre recorded and will not be interactive. However, session two will be interactive on Tuesday. Uh, we will have time for, for question and answer following the uh, presentations. And sessions three and three R will be super interactive, meaning that we will have breakout rooms and facilitated dialogues uh, during those sessions. Consequently, I'd like to share a bit of guidance or housekeeping for the sessions, particularly for those sessions later this week that are super interactive, um, interactive and super interactive. First and foremost, in terms of housekeeping, all participants must have a downloaded version of Zoom to participate in dialogues and breakout rooms. The web-based platform for Zoom is not sufficient for participation in those breakouts. Secondly, note that all participants should use Pathable for the chat function. Thus, for any comments you would like to make during the presentations, during the sessions, uh, and for Q&A, inputs, please use the pathable function. Uh, thirdly, participants should also use pathable for polls, which will take place uh, in sessions three and three R later this week, and to access files, as well as to connect with people in the sessions, finding both new and old friends through this virtual network. So again, download Zoom so that you can actively engage in the sessions use Pathable exclusively for chat functions and use Pathable exclusively for polls and for your access to files and for networking. That's it for my general introduction to the seminar and the four sessions over this week and a bit of housekeeping. And now on to the interesting part, the speakers and content of our first session today on corporate leadership. We are truly honored to have leaders from Corporate Water Alliances, uh, CEO Water Mandate, and the World Business Council on Sustainable Development from Water Risk Reporting and Disclosure and CDP, uh, from corporate leaders in home goods, IKEA, and in agriculture, Cargill, as well as the UNFCCC COP26 High Level Champion for Water, all featured in today's session. The session will begin with a panel discussion, followed by spotlight presentations from IKEA and Cargill, and a closing from our young scientific program committee leader, Sally Weston, a research associate from the University of Sheffield. And without further ado, let's get to the interesting bit, the panel presentation. We're extremely grateful to have Kate Lamb, 
Global Director for Water Security at CDP and the UNFCCC COP26 High Level Champions Lead for Water. Jason Morrison, Head of the CEO Water Mandate and Tom Williams, Director for Nature Action and Water at the World Business Council on Sustainable Development to uh, engage in a panel today. And now before passing it over to Tom, permit me to re reiterate our thanks for your good participation uh, in this session and hand it over to Tom to kick off the panel discussion. Tom, over to you. Thanks, Fred, and great to be part of the World Water Weekend to work with the organizations and companies that have been part of this seminar preparation and delivery. What I would like to do is to briefly introduce some of the key global events coming up in the next uh, six to nine months that will do so much to determine the decade ahead as it relates to corporate water stewardship. We know that water is the great enabler and connector across so many systems. It's essential for food, energy, ecosystem services, and public health. And to varying degrees, corporates need to develop their water stewardship approaches as it relates to these systems. And more and more, we are seeing corporates take a systems approach as they develop their goals, targets, and strategies. More and more, they recognize that it's not just about the actions they take in their own operations, but about how they work across their value chains, how they advocate for change across sectors and policies, and how they engage with citizens. And this year, we see key global meetings that take this systems approach. We have the Food Systems Summit coming up in September the Climate COP coming up in November and the Convention on Biological Diversity COP, which will kick off in October and will conclude in spring next year. And business is engaging in all of these summits. Uh, I will leave it uh, up to Kate to describe the Climate COP. But for the Food Systems Summit, it's the first time that the UN has organized such a meeting and, and one of the action tracks is on nature positive production. And this is where water is most prominently discussed. We all know that food production is the major water user, about 70% of water use. And we are seeing various discussions across stakeholder groups about water stewardship for food production, including farmers, governments, and companies. What we hope comes out of the Food Systems Summit is a collective way forward to a healthy and sustainable food system that has water as a key issue and not as an afterthought as it has been in the past. So if you're not familiar with the Food Systems Summit, please check out their uh, website and see how you can participate on September the 23rd. For the CBD COP, the major development over the coming months is the post-2020 framework, which is similar for nature as to what climate was, um, Paris was for climate. At the end of CBD COP, a new framework for nature will be adopted that will then be actioned by national governments. Freshwater biodiversity is a key part of this. So what we will see coming out of the adopted post-2020 framework is a trajectory for improving freshwater biodiversity. This will be translated into jurisdictional targets and corporates will need to align their strategies and goals to these. So that's a quick overview of how water is showing up in the key global events and initiatives in the next six to nine months as it relates to food and nature. I'm now gonna hand over to Kate, who's going to provide an overview of water and climate, particularly as it relates to the climate COP and associated activities. Kate, over to you. Thank you, Tom, and thanks to everybody watching today. Um, the role of the private sector in helping us achieve our climate ambitions cannot be overstated. Whilst water security is fundamental to achieving those goals, the roles of corporations as users, consumers, potential polluters of that resource have a substantial opportunity to change the face of the race to a more prosperous, resilient climate future that we all deserve. And many of them are getting involved in direct and indirect ways, whether it's directly in partnering with the Marrakesh Partnership Global Action uh, Platform and ensuring that the pathway that we're formulating there towards that future that we want represents the best in available science um, and policy interventions that will deliver on our goals. At the same time, we're seeing increasing number of companies from across a whole range of sectors, whether it's mining, food, apparel, uh, chemicals and pharmaceuticals, or indeed the more traditional water sector itself, joining the race to zero and making really ambitious net zero commitments. And in the case of the water sector in the UK, these net zero commitments are expected to be hit by 2030, a full 20 years before they're legally obliged to hit them in the um, subject to UK law. 
it's this level of ambition that we want to be able to amplify before and at COP26 to ensure that the messages are coming through loud and clear that not only is it possible to achieve short-term net zero goals, but that it's also um, possible to achieve these now and the business is really behind it. So the more that you as businesses can begin to showcase the best practice activities that you have underway, those projects that are delivering substantial climate and water goals, the stronger and more confident governments are likely to be around the world to follow those ambitious um, company commitments with their own. And I'm going to stop there for a moment and pass over to Jason, who will tell us a little bit more about the resilience side, of course, of the climate race. Over to you, Jason. Great. Thanks, Kate. And thanks for including me in this conversation. Talking about leadership on water is uh, one of the most interesting conversations I find and, and inspiring at that. So I want to talk a little bit about the Water Resilience Coalition, which uh, launched last year at World Water uh, Day and was born out of the recognition that we are, need to do more on water faster. We're not on track to meet our SDG 6 sustainable development goal. And we've done little to really de-risk or de-stress any of these major economic regions uh, around the world where water stress is pronounced. And what I'm starting to see as the contours of leadership that are emerging uh, that I would like to speak about is one, the, the, the expansion of the scope uh, of the ambition itself. Uh, historically, a lot of companies had uh, ambition around water reduction or even investing in basins to replenish, but that's a, a water quantity. Uh, related um, ambition. And now you're seeing commitments and strategies and investments around water quality and also around addressing social inequity through investments in water access, sanitation, and hygiene. Uh, the second is an expansion of ambition from direct operations to the entire value chain. And you're seeing leading companies in the apparel sector, for example, like Gap Inc. and Levi's that are gonna apply their net positive water impact commitments to their value chain, which is just really impressive. And you're, we're gonna hear also later from Truca to talk about how they set value uh, chain related water uh, goals for their company. And then there's this idea that the leading companies know they cannot address water through unilateral action or even bilateral action. They need to start uh, working in more collaborative collaborative structures to have impact at scale. And this means leading companies are actively, proactively reaching out to peer companies in water stress regions or their industry sector and really engaging them on water so that there is this ability to have impact at scale. Those are some of the things that I think leading companies are taking on around water uh, and that we're hopeful more uh, companies will endeavor to do so. So that's how I'm seeing uh, leadership emerge in water. Tom, I'd love to hear your and Kate's thoughts on, on what you see as leadership on water from the business community. Yeah, great, thanks, uh, Jason. You know, what I continue to be impressed by with a number of corporates is how engaged they are at a local level. So corporates have really heeded this call to make sure their actions are context specific. And we see some great examples like the 2030 Water Resources Group, um, with their multi-stakeholder platforms, of corporates engaging at a basin level. We should recognize things like the AWS standard as being an important framework that develops understanding and drives action at a site level. So two key things for me are to engage locally, usually at a basin scale, and adopt best practice approaches to water stewardship at a site level. Where I currently see a gap, and I would hope over the coming few years we start to see this addressed, is connecting local action with science-based goals that give a sense of scale and pace at a global level, what is a company's contribution to sustainable water management? How can we assess in a robust way that all those local actions add up to something meaningful that clearly demonstrates a company is responding at the scale and pace necessary? And there are two key initiatives underway that will inform and drive this work. That's the science-based targets for nature, which are due to be finalized at the end of 2022, and the Task Force for Nature-Related Financial Disclosures, the framework of which should be ready uh, in 2023. But corporate shouldn't wait to get started. There is already enough guidance to get moving and be prepared for when these frameworks are finalized. So to sit alongside acting local and adopting best practice approaches, I would add a third aspect of corporate leadership, which is to ensure 
Goals and targets are science-based and water-related impacts and dependencies are reported in a transparent and consistent way. And as you described, Jason, I think the Water Resilience Coalition is a really good example of how we can reach that kind of scale that we need. Okay, over to you. Thanks, Tom, and, and thanks, Jason, for your thoughts also. Um, unsurprisingly, you will expect me to say, you know, disclosure is a, a leading trait for corporations in this space. I would say that, of course, because with my other hat on for, for CEP, um, but it is a genuine need in the market for this type of information that CDP aims to collect to, to, to flow in and ensure that informed decision making from financial institutions all the way through the value chain down to the farm and factory level is, is made transparently and effectively. Um, from my perspective, however, disclosure is the means to an end. It isn't the, the, the silver bullet that's going to solve all of our problems and it isn't just disclosure for disclosure's sake. Genuine corporate leadership on this issue is one in which we see companies putting water at the heart of their business strategies. So we're no longer in a situation, unfortunately, where small intermittent changes are going to deliver the future that we need. We do really need to see radical shifts in the way in which business functions so that more water is made available to those that need it most, particularly in times of scarcity to ensure that the water that is leaving sites or indeed the products that are leaving the sites to be sold in the market are not causing harm through pollution. And this requires significant amounts of innovation, uh, innovation in the way in which water is treated and used on sites, innovation in the way in which chemicals are used and then integrated into products that are sold onto the market. As I say, the time for business as usual, small scale interventions are, is almost over, unfortunately. But arguably, some of the biggest contributions that these companies can make, and those of you watching today, this is all within your ball game. This is all the stuff that you have access and, and uh, control over, is ensuring that your business models themselves live and breathe a water secure future. Let's envision that future together and anticipate what it is you need to do in order to get there. And that's, I think, when we're genuinely going to see real change for the better at all levels of, of the hydrological model that we're talking about. Thank you, Tom. Um, but on that basis, um, you know, at CDP, we've been engaging with institutional investors for the last decade. They're a really important lever for change for our organization. But a question for you and um, you, Tom, and, and you, Jason, is that why do you think it's important that corporates engage with investors, government, and indeed civil society? And how are you guys seeing this playing out in your day-to-day -day operations? So maybe I can pick this up first, Kate. Um, and I think taking a look at the climate space is instructive to understand how this might play out for water. And you know, CDP is obviously very well placed to appreciate this. Um, now investors want to know more about risk value and how corporates are looking ahead to adapting to a changing world. Mm -hmm. The TCFD, so the climate-related um, financial disclosures, provides a widely adopted framework for business to report on this information in a consistent way. So as investors can look across sectors and identify the leaders um, from the laggards, investors are also looking at companies that have validated SPTs in place for climate, that is companies who have established their specific goals and action plans that define their contribution to a net zero world. So going back to what I said earlier about the need for companies to adopt SBTs for nature and the TNFD, these will be critical to ensure that investors have a meaningful and consistent understanding of how business are assessing and responding to water related risk. As it stands at the moment, there are a number of different approaches that companies and investors could take to assess and report on water related impacts and dependencies, which from an investor perspective, makes it really challenging to compare. If company X is using one methodology and company Y is using it another, then it's tricky for an investor to make an informed decision. You know, the bottom line is to why it's important for corporates to engage with investors on water is because ESG investment is becoming mainstream. There's still some way to go to make it more robust and coherent, but the course we are on is that ESG investments will be the norm and will drive market values. And water is clearly embedded within ESG investment frameworks. And I think that's going to become even more critical in the uh, in the years ahead. Jason? Yeah, let me speak a little bit to the uh, public sector and independent sector uh, part of the, Kate's question. Earlier in the week, Sanjeev Chada talked about how we are at an all hands on deck moment. And I just feel like 
right now the business community uh, can play a leadership role, but it cannot do uh, the lift that's needed by itself. Uh, and so if there's a real interest in having impact at scale, it will require these collaborative structures, both the government because of the policy leverage and enabling environment, but also investment dollars. Uh, you know, that it's really unrealistic to think that corporates are gonna underwrite some of the investment that's needed to build water security and resilience in these massive basins. Um, but there's a, a really promising way that leadership from companies, investments like what's done in the Sao Paulo region it, around a water fund being led by the Nature Conservancy, that seed funding came from the corporates. But uh, now th there's about a seven to one ratio on public private spend that underwrites this. And there was a way to innovate around policy change such that all the ratepayers. Uh, and water users in the basin are paying into these nature-based solution investments. So there's a real leverage impact with the public sector. And then for the nonprofit organizations, when companies have realized they need to drive action on the ground in these basins, they're really not going to do it with their site personnel. They need to do it through collaborative partnerships. And quite frankly, the WASH NGOs and the environmental NGOs have the technical capability, they have the relationships with the communities to be able to undertake these water related projects and to move them forward. So I think that's why it's an all hands on deck, why that the business community needs to be thinking about working both with these two other segments of society in order to have impact at scale. Great, thanks a lot, Jason. And you know, we've heard and spoken about sort of systems change, the role of different stakeholders, et cetera, and the different levers that we need to be looking at and, and pulling. So a final question for Kate and then Jason, you know, as we look ahead to the next five years or so, what do you think are going to be the real big levers for corporate action around water that we should be um, sort of directing our efforts and energy towards? Kate, over to you first. Thanks, Tom. Um, it's an exciting prospect for me to think ahead for another five years. We've all, the collective three of us, have been working on this issue for 10 years. And I think we're, we're, I'm really optimistic about the fact that we're going to see the fruits of that labour really coming, uh, coming home. I certainly hope so. Um, from my perspective, disclosure again, but this time from a different perspective, because for the last decade, financial institutions have been the, the scrutineers of corporate practice, right? There's been very little attention or energy directed towards what the financial institutions themselves are doing to mitigate and manage the water-related impacts of their own financed activities. And when you consider the trillions of dollars that are flowing through loan books and flowing through investment portfolios every single year, the opportunity for genuine systemic transformation in that framework is huge. So from 2022 onwards, CDP will be issuing our first ever water related disclosure framework for financial institutions themselves, asking them about the practices and performance of the companies they choose to invest in or loan to. And with that, we hope to spark a uh, or trigger a transformation, I guess, or a, a cascade effect of action from the from the 695 financial institutions that we'll target all the way through to the companies that are um, receiving or benefiting from the financed arrangements that they um, they're participating in it's really effective it, for me it's it feels like a, a very personal um, career highlight i think it's arguably one of the most important projects that i'll ever run um, so i'm really excited to to take it forward at the same time CDP and, 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 and Jason and you, Tom, we've all been highlighting the dearth of civil society activity with regards to stewardship and accountability for private sector. You know, the last time there was any real sticks thrown into this space was in 2011 with Greenpeace's Dirty Laundry campaign. Very powerful, very effective campaign that shone a light on the poor practices within the apparel sector it really did trigger a transformation within that sector, so much so that the companies still talk about that report again. But that report was written in 2011. And so we're now seeing more um, civil society actors in the slightly more activist space stepping up and wanting to play a bigger role in holding firms accountable for the commitments that they're making and also for the commitments that they're failing to meet. So I think that promises to be a powerful lever that those companies that are not yet ahead of the curve on this issue need to get, make sure that they've got their, their house in order fairly swiftly. Finally, I'll just point out um, the race to win the climate race itself. The, the, the commitments that we're seeing there, the need 
triggered by the IPCC report just last week to bring about a radical transformation in the way in which we, we function as a society, otherwise risk facing catastrophic climate consequences will bring forth inevitable policy responses from governments worldwide that ensures that water resources management is front and center of our climate resilience response, whether that's increased water pricing, reallocation of water from one particular sectoral use towards another that may offer a slightly more or a larger, more beneficial societal benefit. Um, and coupled with that with uh, increased protection of, of, of sensitive wastewater, uh, sorry, sensitive water ecosystems and wastewater management. I'm really optimistic that governments will start to play their role in ensuring that, that, that proper appropriate levers are pulled to, to drive the action that we want to see. But Jason, what are you what are you excited about for the year ahead or five years ahead? Yeah, so I the lever I see of change, uh, and I don't know if it's a lever that the global business is going to be able to pull or push or have control over. I also don't know if it's a carrot or a stick, maybe both, is the youth. And I think mm -hmm. uh, the young people uh, of today and their expectations around action on climate uh, is going to be one of the most powerful drivers of action by companies. And I think there's this adage we all know, if you're not part of the solution, you're part of the problem. And I think what the global companies need to understand in, in many sectors where the youth is the primary business, whether you're in fast moving consumer goods or apparel or, or food and bev, there is an expectation now that companies are not continuing to be part of the problem. And in fact, I think there's a real brand benefit to being seen as a company that's on the right side of the equation. And when you start moving away from this historical mindset we've had around CSR of this do no harm approach to, I'm not gonna not only do no harm, but I'm gonna be part of the solution. That's a shift, that's the fundamental shift. And once you get a critical mass of companies that are gonna position their brand and their company in that space, in that way, is gonna be a groundswell of change, I, I believe. And if it's not in the next five years, I, I would argue it's already happening now, but if it's not in the next five years, it's gonna happen in, over the course of the next decade uh, meaningfully. And I think it's a great level of change and I'm gonna to look to incubate it and amplify it any way our organization can do so. So I understand we're getting the hook uh, in terms of timing. So I wanna introduce our next speakers, uh, two leading companies that are taking action on water. First, we have Lena Hula with IKEA, followed by Truka Schmor from Cargill to talk about the work they're doing. Hi, I'm Lena Yule. I'm the Sustainability Manager for IKEA Range. I'm here to tell you a bit about our journey towards water positive and the actions we take across the IKEA value chain. The IKEA vision is to create a better everyday life for the many people. The way we do this is by providing affordable, functional home furnishings for the many people but it also entails how we work across the value chain to ensure we have a positive impact on both people and planet. We have stores in 60 markets and we work with nearly 1600 suppliers. So our reach and our impact is large. Most of us would never treat coffee or milk like water, you know, leave it running without worrying too much. But water, that's just water. And maybe that's why it's in trouble. At IKEA, we're doing everything in our power to use less water. We're rethinking our range, the food we offer, the raw materials we use, and our production methods. Together with our suppliers, we have saved and keep on saving millions of cubic meters of water. And the common factor is this, do more with less. We're not asking anyone to stop using water. We're joining forces to find ways to use less water. How we use the tap at home matters. And when you think about it, three words is all we need to capture all the things IKEA, our suppliers, and our customers do to save water. Mind the tap. IKEA is committed to becoming water positive, working across our full value chain. We see the increasing challenges with water availability and quality in the world. A situation that will only be exacerbated by climate change. And we want to, and we are truly committed to doing our part. Our strategic focus areas are to enable reduced water consumption in the home, improving water quality and water availability throughout our value chain, and show leadership and collaboration on the global stage for a water positive future. 
And to deliver on these objectives, we have to really consider where IKEA has an influence. In materials, our levers for change include better sourcing and working with supply chain partners on a long-term basis to address both water quality and water use. We are also switching to new and better materials. In production, we encourage suppliers to move towards smarter production methods and technologies. In product use at home, IKEA has for a long time offered water-saving solutions to our customers, often built into the products we sell and also as innovations that also tell a story that bring awareness and enables customers to care about the water use in their home. Our starting point was to identify and track water use across the full value chain in order for us to be able to take the most impactful actions. Materials and food ingredients make up the largest part of IKEA water use at 78%, while product use at home stands at 15%. The analysis of water use from different IKEA material groups show, as expected, that the textile industry is the most water intensive. Textiles represent more than 50% of the estimated total water use for IKEA material sourcing. Therefore, a majority of IKEA water projects are connected to textile production. Let's take a look into some examples. As early as 2007, IKEA committed to improving the cotton industry and reducing its harmful effects. The goal was set to use 100% cotton from more sustainable sources. That means that it's cotton grown with less water, chemical, fertilizers, and pesticides, compared, of course, to conventional cotton. The goal was achieved in 2015 with a 20% reduction in water and fertilizer use. But as a large business with a large impact, the journey continues. Key actions going forward include using recycled materials instead of virgin, which shows the potential to become 20 to 25% more water efficient. IKEA has also been working in partnership with WWF since 2005 to promote and implement water stewardship practices. In our cotton sources, we work directly with farmers to support them in learning and adopting more efficient water saving techniques. In India, Pakistan and Turkey, our collective efforts have seen farmers achieve more crop per drop, better yields and water savings of up to 25%. In India alone, we have trained 30,000 farmers. Key actions going forward for agriculture-based materials include better irrigation, like drip irrigation, and efficient use of dusk and dawn. In production, our analysis show that many of our home furnishing suppliers are located in high or actually even extremely high water stressed areas. We believe in building long-term relationships with our suppliers, and we place a strong emphasis on supplier development. The average length of collaboration with our home furnishing suppliers is 11 years. This close relationship gives us the ability to drive long-term change. Many of our textile suppliers are moving towards better treatment processes. One supplier, for example, in Bangladesh, has set up the first zero liquid discharge plant in the country, reducing groundwater consumption by 80%. One of our partners in Pakistan achieved 60% recycled water by implementing an advanced water filtering system. As a next step, we are setting up a baseline for quality and quantity of water use and identifying the technologies needed. This will help us to develop roadmaps toward becoming water positive. Then we turn to product use at home. This is, of course, the heart of the IKEA business. IKEA has an ambition to inspire and enable more than 1 billion people to live healthy and sustainable lives within the boundaries of the planet. The way we do that is to ensure that our products are attractive, desirable, and affordable, making it an easy choice for the many and not a luxury for the few. Today, more than 40% of IKEA store visitors live in high water stressed regions. We have a really unique opportunity to work with our customers to lower our shared water footprint. In fact, 15% of our total water fit footprint comes from the water that runs through the taps and showers that we sell. As you might know, in Europe, we use approximately 150 liters and in the US between 200 and even up to 500 liters per person every day. This is what we all need to change. Our innovation work focuses on the activities in the home that use the most water. 
Showers are responsible for roughly 40% of household water use, toilets about 25, and washing clothes roughly 11%. Our ambition is to enable as many people as possible to create their water positive home. To achieve this, we focus on creating new solutions for cleaning like water treatment and filtration, reducing flows in all water outlets in the home, recovering water and energy, reusing water, and making the right water quality available for the right activity within the home. We have to ask ourselves questions like, do we really need to flush the toilet with drinking water? Here are a few examples of what we have achieved up to now. The nozzle called Misten, created together with the startup company Altered, is reducing flow by up to 90% by creating a mist or spray. On the right, our pressure compensating aerator limits the flow from the tap independent of water pressure. All our showers come with a flow regulator that sets sh shower flow to a fixed eight liters a minute independent of the pressure in the water system. Sensor taps in the right picture is a smart way to save water, turning off and on by movement. We're not stopping there. We have a lot of new innovations in the pipeline. For example, in fiscal year 20, IKEA and the Danish company Flowloop partnered to develop a water recycling shower solution. The solution that we're developing together aims to save up to 80% of water and reduce energy up to 70% compared to average shower solutions. The solution will recycle and clean the shower water in a closed loop. This is one of the many water innovations we are working on, and there's more to come. Today, I'm also really excited to share that IKEA will join the 50 Liter Home Coalition with a vision to make 50 liters of daily water use per person an aspiration for all. The coalition brings together companies, policymakers, innovators, researchers, and communities to develop and scale innovation for efficient water use at home. The IKEA story is, and always will be, one of constant change. We're always on the way. Our vision to create a better everyday life for the many people encourages us to be innovative, persistent, and brave. Questions and challenges for the future include setting science-based goals for our water agenda and responding to the increasing pressure climate change will place, both on our suppliers and our customers. Most things remain to be done, and IKEA, we call that a glorious future. Or, as our founder Ingvar said, the mest är nu gjort underbara framtid. Thank you. So... Thank you all and uh, welcome everyone to this wonderful session. I'm Trukas Smore, I'm Cargo Sustainability Director for Water. So about Cargo, so Cargo is a an, an food and agricultural company and basically what we do is we connect on one hand the farmers uh, with our customers and we and one of the many ways of we, uh, how we do that is that we transform raw materials into finished goods and we move products around the world. And we do that at scale. We have uh, about 155,000 employees that work in, in about 70 countries. And we've done that for quite a while. At Cargill, we have looked at our uh, sustainability strategy and really looked at how can we drive meaningful change address water where it's needed most. And with that, it got us to form our global ambition, focusing on our facilities, our supply chain, and our communities. But not only that, we have to, we said we have to look at water availability, quality, and access. And this session is about business practices and how we can drive that meaningful change through water and creating water resilience. And how we got to this global ambition, I'd like to share through a little story of an experience I had just uh, some months ago when we did a water risk assessment for one of our facilities uh, close to Amsterdam in the Netherlands. And as we were doing these water, this water risk assessments, um, this uh, facility was selected as a priority facility because of their large water use. And I had this conversation with the plant manager and he was, he was basically challenging me. He was asking us like, well, we have all this water use, but..." we are located next to the river. We are so close to the outlet where the river reaches the sea. And the water that we're using is returned to the same source as we're taking it from, just with a slightly higher temperature. How is that driving change? What is the water issue? 
And it led to a discussion to say, well, what is the water issue? Because clearly it's not about water availability, but what else is there? And we started talking about water quality, but also about the uh, water temperature and the need for having uh, the right amount of cooling water available. And that get to the insight of the synergies between water and climate and needing to integrate, not only looking at water management, but really looking at how we can optimize to use our water efficiency, but uh, efficiently, but also have um, be ready for increasing temperatures. Um, but next to that, we have some about, like, well, what else is there? What about too much water? And the site is actually uh, very, very close to the sea, how about sea level rise? And then the plan manager started, started discussing against this, that both. The moment that you look at this side and say, this is a water risk facility because of sea level rise, we have to take almost like a quarter of the country as being in, a, in the water risk area. And then the next question is like, well, how can we actually uh, contribute to that? What are we contributing to that issue? And how can we drive meaningful change? And it is those kind of questions that really drive, has driven our development of our strategy. What is the issue in the local context? How are we contributing to it? And what is them? What, how can we drive meaningful change to address these issues in their context? And that is what led us to these uh, numbers and these commitments that you see here. So to take you on that journey, it starts with like looking at the local context. I looked here, took the map for water availability. And what you see is that when you look at this map, very large sections of these maps actually are yellow or light, light uh, colored, which means they face less water availability issues. So by zooming in on those orange and red zones, it means that we can prioritize action. So that gets to the next, next question of, so how are we contributing to that? And I think the key issue there is to look beyond not only what we do in our operations, but looking at that full value chain. And for Cargill, on where we sit in that value chain, it's very, very clear that our key impact is in agriculture. And so when we did our analysis and developed our strategy, we looked and mapped out where our agricultural footprint is and compare that to where the issues are. And so what you can see here is when you're starting to look at availability and consumption, then the impact is not in industry. And, and so as we were looking through this analysis, we applied those concepts to look at how can we drive meaningful change and how can we connect with agriculture. So that gets back to these actual quantitative numbers where we said we restore 600 million liters and we reduce 5 million kilograms. But the key issue here is not the numbers. The key issue is, is in those priority watersheds. It has to be addressed in that local context. Which get us to say is like, whenever we talk about our numbers, we have to accompany it with the map that shows where these priority watersheds are and whether their availability is an issue or water quality or access to safe drinking water. And we connect that with our priority water facilities. But then it gets to the third question. So how can we drive meaningful change? What can we actually do about these issues in the local country? At Target, we believe agriculture is how we will deliver on these commitments. Um, our purpose is to nourish the world in a safe, responsible, and sustainable way. And agriculture is really the connecting point to this. So how, how does that work? Since we launched our new targets uh, last year, we have initiated uh, projects in 16, 16 new priority watersheds. And what that means, like to just to give you a couple of examples, um, in Nebraska, we focused on our irrigation projects with farmers and see how we can optimize irrigation. But also um, in Iowa, we looked at uh, soil health practices. And I think one of the beauties we see through the connection with agriculture, that's not only about improving water quality and availability, it goes hand in hand with reducing our emissions and uh, looking at how we can optimize uh, and enhance farmer livelihoods. So through agriculture, we can really connect not only improving water availability and quality, but also reducing and optimizing uh, the greenhouse gas emissions and the farmer livelihoods. With that, thank you. So COP26, as I stated earlier, starts in less than, it's either 15 or 10 weeks. Either way, it starts at the beginning of November. 
and we need as many companies to be getting involved as possible. And there are a whole range of ways in which you can get involved. You can get involved right now, for example, by joining both the Race to Resilience and the Race to Zero. If you go on the website, Google those terms, you will find a way to join. We're using those both of those platforms, again, to showcase the, the bold ambition from private sector so that it begets bold, ambitious outcomes from governments worldwide. And we need as many companies as possible to be joining those initiatives, particularly from a water perspective, so that we can really showcase both your commitment to the issues and ultimately the leadership that is in, uh, in abundance, if you look carefully for it, across the private sector. So that's now very easy very straightforward steps that you can take to showcase your leadership. At the same time, there are a range of organizations stepping forward and putting through some really innovative research that we're able to showcase at COP26 itself. Whether this is research associated with new innovative forms of, of supply chain management or new ways of governing um, water related ecosystems from their perspectives. Um, it's an exciting opportunity for us to bring forth some of the leading thinking in this space and showcase what is on offer from within the private sector, particularly from an innovation perspective. Then there's the event itself. This begins, as I say, on the, at the beginning of November and runs for two weeks. The main water day is going to be on the 5th of November and there will be a three hour session during that day, both in person and digitally, uh, showcasing, I'm going to use that word a lot because it is a time of, of real celebration, I think, but showcasing some of the, the most important strategic interventions that are emerging from the non-state actor space, whether it is those UK and other worldwide water utility companies that are running towards net zero as soon as possible, or whether it is organizations that are really transforming their value chains so that the water resilience of the communities that they operate within and depend upon is enhanced and indeed ensured. Um, that session, uh, I'm currently pulling the, the timeline together for it, um, but it promises to be an exciting one. And if you'd like to learn more, um, please just do contact me directly. Um, the final piece of information I wanted to give you about COP26 itself is that there will be the first ever water and climate pavilion at COP26 itself. This is, for those of you that have been to uh, trade shows, and I'm sure many of you have, this is essentially a, a stand, although a slightly fancier stand, um, that we'll have in place for the full two weeks of the event. We are running a series of, of programs throughout the two weeks, again, to highlight um, not only some of the leading leading innovations that we're seeing emerging from across the non-state actor environment, but also to, to discuss some of the challenges that are emerging and find ways through those. There's a, a, an opportunity to have, have your work showcased on this pavilion. If you Google, you will find the page. It's linked with uh, Seaweed's uh, website where the application to host a session at the uh, pavilion can be found. You would be responsible if you're successful for building as, as innovative, um, as exciting, as um, climate relevant session as you possibly can. Whether it is bringing forward the way that your workers or your supply chain staff's voices to shout about loudly the importance of water related issues as it relates to climate change. Or whether indeed it's something about showcasing the innovative products that are emerging from your value chains or indeed maybe even bringing forth voices from indigenous or youth groups to speak to Jason's passion point earlier, um, enabling them to get to COP26 and showcase their work and their passions for the issue. Opportunities abound, but in order for me to be able to do my job properly, I need to be able to amplify everything that you have going on at the moment. So don't be shy with coming forward. Um, we want to see the best of the best emerging so that we can inspire the next COP27, the COP28, COP29 and beyond all the way through to the net zero future that we really desire. So thank you so much for joining us today. I'm now going to head out and hand over to Sally Watson, who's going to be closing the session for us this afternoon. I hope you enjoy the rest of the conference. Thank you. On behalf of the conveners and the SPC, as the young SPC leader for this important seminar, I'd like to take the opportunity to thank the audience for joining our session today. I'm sure you will agree it's been an honour to learn from our speakers. 
We've heard through presentations and discussion how water is universally critical to business resilience, both in response to short-term shocks like the COVID-19 pandemic, but also in long-term mitigation of climate change impacts. We must urgently change our thinking around the duty of businesses to engage with and champion effective water stewardship. Businesses are users, consumers, and possible polluters of water, and therefore need to engage locally throughout the value chain to achieve radical shifts in our relationship with water. Such initiatives like those coordinated by CDP, CEO Water Mandate, WBCSD, and backed by dedicated corporate leaders like Cargill and IKEA must be at the top of the corporate agenda because the potential impacts of water-related risks far the outweigh, outweigh the cost of inaction. Leadership is key to accelerating change and our business leaders must drive this action forward by amplifying ambitions on the journey to net zero. As our speakers have mentioned, upcoming global events like COP26 in Glasgow are opportunities for business leaders to showcase and lead their industry, governments and policymakers to prioritize water resilience as our global economies build forward toward a climate and water secure future. This session is just the beginning of the conversation. Our further sessions during this week will impact different strategies for businesses' water resilience. On Tuesday, we have an interactive session on collective action, where we'll hear from corporate experiences and efforts through climate, uh, so through case studies and a panel discussion. On Wednesday and Thursday, our super interactive sessions will explore approaches and standards through lightning presentations and breakout rooms for further discussion. In closing, on behalf of the conveners in the SPC, I'd like to reiterate our thanks to our wonderful speakers for sharing their insight and experiences today. And to everyone at home, thank you for attending this session and we hope that you will join us later in the week. <laughs>